One and two fifteens because the cost difference on this is so little. Yeah. yeah. Then I wound up. We were talking about doing an open. Uh, you, yeah, you ended up going with the dome. Yeah, only, only, only because I spent a lot of time under it. Yeah. see the overall revenues decline or stay even. We want to, um, we want you to uh, put this plate on a, on, a, on your car if you don't already have a specialty plate. So anyway, uh, that's the story. We hope you'll consider that. And we'll be doing some publicity uh, over the summer once it becomes available. Thank you. All right, so tonight's public hearing is uh, under Mass General Law Chapter 30A, uh, 130.17.8104 and the rest. Uh, we will be taking comments through uh, this Friday, March 1st. So anything that you don't say tonight, or if you want to reinforce it with a letter to the director, I recommend you do that. The proposals fall into a few categories, strike bass conservation, the commercial uh, strike bass uh, season, um, some for higher compliance issues regarding scuffle black sea bass, which is exclusively a south coast, in the sound, but it's a big issue. Um, uh, scuff bycatch limits for the drivers fishing down south, and then some technical corrections on commercial trip limits and quota management. So what we'll do is we'll go through each of these one at a time. But first, Dr. Mike Armstrong, uh, who works for GMF and is also the chairman of the ASMFC Strike Bass Management Board, is going to give a short presentation, and I think it's, it's valuable. It is the background information. It is coming over the horizon in terms of the management changes over the next year. So the proposals that we're talking about tonight uh, are going to be really important for management later this year and next year and beyond. So Mike's going to give you an update. It's uh, hot off the press. I think you'll find it useful. Mike? Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, you all hear me all right? Yeah. My I'll, I'll speak up. It always does. Yes, it does. Uh, so anyways, Dan said, 
there is a new assessment of the stock that's just come off the press. It's, I'm not sure if it's official yet, um, but the results you're going to see are what it's going to be. Uh, and we had an initial meeting of the board where we realized we're going down this road, we are overfished, overfishing is occurring. And this is new for this stock. And I'll show you some of the details and I'll show you the data and why it changed. I'll start off with, I don't believe the stock is much different than it was two years ago. What's different is there's a new model and there's new MRIC data. And it completely changed the picture of what we're looking at now. So this is the catch comparisons. Um, the red line down the bottom, is this is coastwide and millions of fish. On the left is the harvest, what you take home. On the right are the live releases. The red is what we've been using under the old MRIP. The new numbers are the new MRIP. Oh. In that case, you'll have to trust me. That's, uh, So anyway, the peak, the peak on the left is around five, about six million fish. And on the right, you're looking at 50, 60 million fish that we throw back. Um, so the net result is the new MRIP estimates, which are coming from the effort. So MRIP, many of you know, is a combination of interviews of fishermen that gets a catch per unit effort. What's the catch per trip? There's a phone, a, sorry, a, a mail survey that gets how many trips you did. You multiply those, it gives you how many striped bass were caught, and the new estimates compared to the old, which was phone, and became very inefficient because everyone's got cell phones, which are not public record. Uh, in spite of all the spam we get on them, we can't get to them legitimately. Um, the new estimates are 100% are higher. We've doubled what we thought we were catching. That's not bad, that doesn't mean, it usually means the stock was just twice as big. Um, and we were hoping it was just a scaler, um, but it turned out it wasn't. So this is coming out of the model. This is recruitment, and this is an important thing. What we're, what we're fishing on commercially, and the fish that were right here, you can see it 2005 to 2011. These are one-year-olds. That whole group of fish from, from here to here, you can see what's at best, average, at worst, not very good. That is what's in commercial size now. That's contributed to why we didn't hit our quota. There really is a downturn. But there's a lot of fish coming. The 2011 year class right here is big. The 2015 is even bigger. So these guys will be about 22 inches this year. These guys are just coming into commercial size at eight years old, about 34 inches ish so this is almost all the same spawning stock biomass this is what happens when you have a species that is environmentally determined how many young are created every year you have huge year classes you have little ones and you got medium ones that's completely natural and to have a swing of a poor recruitment is is a roll of the dice and so we're dealing with that that's part of the downturn but this is what the new model says this is fishing mortality. You have a threshold when you're above that, you're considered overfished. All right. And then you have a target. That's where we want to be. And you can see we we're pretty good under the old model. I, I don't have that run, unfortunately, here. But according to this, we've been overfished for the last seven or eight years. And again, that's primarily the new data and the new model. So no one did anything wrong. We didn't allow overfishing willingly, we didn't know. The data is considered better, the model is considered better, so we just have a better eyeball on what's going on with this stock. And it tells us we have to cut out. The result of this slide right here says we need to cut out. So we need to get down from 0.3 to 0.2. It's not a scale you can interpret, it's not linear, it's, it's, a, it's calculus, but that 10 percentage point is probably 15% cut in fishing mortality, something like that. 
And here's what's been happening with the female stock biomass. Um, again, we were pretty flat. We were right on the threshold for the last few years. And this shows you that we've been going down for a while. Um, this peak here is really formed by those massive year classes that we have back here. Then we'll be going down. You can see at the end, you see it flattening out. That's the 2011 year class entering into SSB, spawning stock biomass, which they don't start entering into until about six or seven. So they're now eight years old. The 20 levers are part of SSB. That will help us build. But we need to cut F, fishing mortality, to husband that year class along. And then behind it, 2015 will help immensely too. So we're poised to rebuild if we do the right thing to cut fishing mortality. So this is the stunning one, as I'm quoted in the paper saying. Um, we know this has been going on, but it seems to be worse under the new model. Um, these are dead numbers of dead fish. Um, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, that's cut off. So you're looking at peaks of almost 10, 11 million fish. Oh, it is. Okay. Um, this is commercial cake. This is commercial discard. This is recreational cake that you bring home. This is what dies when you discard it. One of the local newspapers completely interpreted this wrong. So 48% of all dead bass on the East Coast are from release mortality. That doesn't mean 48% of all bass die when you release them. What we use is 9%, and that's an average. At times it's 40 times it's three. It depends on what you're using for gear and the water temperature and the salinity. But stunning, 48% of all bass are fish you throw back, and most of them aren't floating. Most of them, you, you revive them, they go away, and they bleed to death, and they lie on the bottom. So they're not floaters. The floaters you all have seen, that's probably they've been mistreated to drag across uh, uh, the gunnel and left on the deck for a little bit. They, can we, yeah. Wait till I'm done with the presentation. Good. Um, so anyway, that's a big deal. So if we can work on that 42% harvest and the 8% commercial harvest, but we're only working on 50% of the harvest, and we can do that. We go up to the size limit, we'll work, we'll get rid of some of the harvest. We'll have a little bit more wreck this but it's not proportional. Um, so keep that in mind as we're going, it's one of the, reasons why we're thinking circle hooks. It's not, circle is not the panacea, you're not gonna bring that to zero, but you will bring it down. So anyway, just to show that we are the problem, and it's not a problem, we've got a great fishery. Uh, up in the right hand corner is Massachusetts. This is the harvest. So if you look at this, just look at the scale on the left, it changes, so Maine, Peaks at about 150. Massachusetts, we're up by 1,000. The only ones who have us beat or harvest is New York and Maryland. And that changes every year. Um, Maryland's harvest includes the, uh, the netting, the commercial, that one? Yes. Oh, well, no, no sorry, this, this is recreational. recreational. Yeah. Um, but your class strength really affects. So Maryland sees the fish when they're this big and they harvest the heck out of it. We see them when they're this big and harvest the heck out of them. Uh, but this is, uh, we are the number one discarder on the East Coast by far. So you can see we are up around 20 million for scale. Even Maryland is only up around 12 and New York's four. We are a catch and release state and we're also loaded with small fish. And so we discard more fish than anyone on the East Coast. And that's, that's something to think about as we're trying to save fish and decrease fishing mortality. So anyway, uh, to summarize what I just said, striped bass are overfished, overfishing is occurring, there is no getting around that. That is the assessment. And a lot of it's due to the new data, and we have a better view. The recreational fishery is responsible for 90% of the deaths on the East Coast, and of that, about half is catching the Mass is largely catch and release. I said that in 2017, we released 13 million fish. Last year was more like 
seven or eight. Um, and it goes up and down with schoolies. Um, so if you apply 9% to 13 million, that's 1.1 million fish. We took home 300,000 for dinner. We killed 1.1 million cryptically. We put them back in the water and they died. And that's based on studies that were done in this state. Uh, really good studies that were done in this state. Um, so anyway, uh, the commercial fishery in this state lands about 45,000. Now, of course, those are bigger uh, versus the, the releases, and that affects the proportional mortality, um, but far and away, the rep release is still the most mortality. Hey, so, real quick on that, you wrote 20 pounds on that slide. Are you talking 20, 20 fish? 30, no, 34 inch fish is 19 to 20 pounds. Oh, I see what you're saying, a 20 pound of fish. Yeah, so this was just illustrating how we divide the quota by 19 to 20 pounds when you get from commercial fish. So the management challenges um, is we need to reduce fishing mortality. We're going to start an amendment or an addendum. They're subtly different, addendum's a little quicker, depends on how much work we want to do. This will likely involve if the, the uh, technical committee was charged to come back and say, how much do we have to cut next meeting in early May? I bet it's around 15%. If that's what it is, we can probably achieve that by a one inch raise, maybe two inches, go to 29 to 30. Um, and generally what happens is we cut the commercial quota proportionally. Um, let's see. So. Given that we're a catch and release fishery, even if we go up in size, we will not reduce mortality as much as other states will that take more on, unfortunately. So we're um, thinking that circle hooks is part of the solution for us. And we're getting a little ahead of the curve. It might become mandatory under ASMFC. So our proposal is not to do circle hooks this year. It's do it next year at the earliest. We need to bring in um, some of the big tackle shops and things like that. And if you go into a lot of the stores now, uh, the, bait, the little bait and tackle is pretty good. You don't have to dig sporting goods. You can't find an appropriate circle hook to save your life. There are 350 hooks, and none of them uh, are going to save bass. So, anyway, our proposal is to require inline circle hooks. And we know there's a bunch of varieties. But if you're in line, not offset at all, most of them work pretty well. What has been shown through a number of different studies is it reduces the incident of gut hooking by about 90%. So they still gut hook. But if they do gut hook, because the, 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 uh, the hook is curved in, it'll grab the stomach, it'll grab the esophagus, where J hook will pierce through the esophagus, and the heart lies right against the esophagus. Um, and you can pierce the heart, and if you do, you can bleed to death, or pierce a bunch of other organs and bleed to death and die. Um, so it greatly reduces mortality. Um, currently required in Maine, New Jersey, in some instances in Maryland, just put it in. Uh, so what we'd like to hear about is things like, should the commercial fish be part of this requirement? Should the head book, uh, charter book industry, Part of this also, or should we just target the wreck for, for everyone? And how does this impact other fishing? Um, we don't have environmental police here, but it does get tricky if you're blue fishing with J hooks and you hook up with a bass. Technically, I believe the environmental police will say if you vote that fish, it, it'll be a violation. Um, so that needs to be discussed too. And then our other proposal is to ban the use of gas to strike bass in the water. That would be getting this year. We're, we're not wet to that. This is one we don't have data. We have nothing. We have primarily anecdotal data that it happens in the recreational fishing. Uh, short bass get gaff. Um, we hear about it, and so the question is, should we ban it? And the same, the same types of things. Should the commercial be involved? Should charity be involved? In some ways, it's a no-brainer because there's other ways to bring them on. We heard a lot of arguments against it uh, last night. 
So gaffs are currently prohibited in Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Maryland, Virginia. So it does, people have found a way to work around the gaps in those states. Um, and again, should, who should be subject to this rule? Do you think the question is on the overall question on the comment? Yeah. Uh, well, why don't we do the, the yeah. If there's some assessment questions, but I'll say we're not here to debate it. There, people have a lot of problems and questions about MRIP. It's We can debate it all we want, but it's shut down our growth. We, we have already eaten the MRIP, if you want. We can't debate it, so that's how we're going to have to go. But did you have a question? Yes, I was. Um, uh, Captain Skip Martell, I'm a local charter guide. I've uh, been catching leaves for a long time. So what I'd like to know is how can you make an assessment of the fish that floats to the bottom on this mortality? I'm not sure how you can do that scientifically. We don't know. So we have to, we estimate how many are thrown back. That it has error bars and it's an estimate. But what we do is we apply a number of 9% that came through several studies. And that may be low. That same study that said 9% it went as high as 26% when the temperature was high, when we got treble hooks on the side of the face, things like that. Um, in Chesapeake Bay, that number is probably 30% in the summer because it, it's 85 degrees. And that is the most dangerous thing for fish is warm temperatures. So you see what I mean? It's an estimate. Yeah. It, yeah. It, um, but, so, so we don't want to measure. Done statistically? Was it done? It was done I mean, statistically. Did, did anybody get in a in the water and look at the bottom. I mean, I'm being facetious, but no. So it was done statistically, statistically as it opposed to very to like you're saying. Yeah. No, we're so not. So why don't we do away with trouble hooks too? <laughs> if you'd like to add that, to the <laughs> yes, I would. Yeah, <laughs> Mike, uh, I read where some of these other states where they implemented circle hooks, they didn't get the reduction they anticipated. Can you speak to that at all? Um, the only one I know is Maryland because they're the most recent. The others were quite a while ago. They, they had a bunch of problems. They wound up exempting some fisheries. Um, their people, their fishermen had a lot of trouble getting circle hooks. Um, they said they had great compliance. Uh, and Maryland is the one who did the study that said it's reduced it by 9%, 90%. So the effect it was not because of the circle that was don't work, it's because they didn't implement it as well as they could have. I don't know if that answers your question. Wayne back. Yeah, the recreational fisheries seem yeah. to, be, to be a bigger problem, the recreational fisheries. And uh, would it help if you bring the size down so you don't have to release as many fish? Yeah, if you bring it down, the lower you go, the more people take home. One, because rookies can catch a fish that they bring home. And Let's face it, I'd rather eat a 20 inch fish than a 30 inch fish. Um, but anyway, so let's let's not get sidetracked. We will be back here probably the end of this year with the ASMFC amendment to solicit questions on how we reduce that. Probably size range. We might want to do a slot limit from 28 to 39, mm -hmm. say yeah. bigger fish. It's all on the table right now. So confined, so let's move away from assessment and let's talk about the circle hooks. Should we do it? And you can do gaps at the same time. Hey, before yes. we go on to that, I, I wanted you to uh, explain just the numbers a little bit. The, the, the big caveat that everybody's hearing, and we've heard this before, Rob Savino, by the way, is my name, Rob Savino. I, I fish out of Boston, I don't run a charter boat. The reason why I, I would like you to kind of give us some more details on what changed with this formula that they're getting this new data from? Is it now because that they're able to target fishermen more than just the general recreational population instead of calling people using their registrations more than calling yes. people who have licenses, right? Yep. And that's probably refining your data more. But we've heard this before on the model changing and everything looks bleak and worse with the cod fishery, right? So now all of a sudden this magical model changes where we're in trouble. So what happened with the model? Can you explain what the changes were? That well, the model, changed. the model was tweaked. A number of parameters were changed. Um, the maturity schedule, um, 
I, I can't think of all the, but they're very technical. And they did sensitivity analysis and took them in, took them out. And those didn't have the technical merits of the model, didn't do a lot. It was the new Emmerich data that drove this pattern, the new pattern. So to the Emmerich data, it's, it's coming from the effort estimates, which are twice as much as they were. So the old phone, the old survey was phone calls blindly to coastal households. It was inefficient. If you did, so the sample size was smaller. If you did happen to reach an angler, it was dinner time, your wife was yelling at them. So you asked them how many trips they did in the last two months, and they banged out a number. And they hung up. So now they get a mailing with two dollars, <laughs> which actually increases the efficiency. So they can sit with their logbook, they can consult other anglers in the house and put multiple anglers in. And we, we don't know exactly why it went up as much as it did as it did, and they're doing studies trying to figure out. But that's the net result, is the anglers in, in writing are reporting much more trips than they did when they're doing it over the phone. Yes? Hey there, Karen Free from Lucky 7 Chart. Uh, I'm also a scientist uh, for my day job. And when I'm looking at data, there's a lot of data presented that I don't think anybody in this room can really look at and say whether or not we agree with it. Um, it's you know, hard to wrap your head around. So I look at some of the data that was presented that we can wrap our head around. And I'm not sure about anybody else, but my average fish that I catch isn't 20 pounds. Uh, that's released. It's not 20 pounds. No, that's the average no, no, no. weight of a commercially sold fish. Understood. But I think what we were talking about was the 90% of the fish that are thrown back in our, or in, have a mortality rate of 90% are by recreation, recreational boats, is what I just heard. And therefore, you calculated 20 pounds, 20, a 20 pound fish times however many thousands of fish to come up with a number. That's not what I heard? No, no, so 90% by number, of all dead fish on the East Coast come from the recreational fishery. It's not apples and oranges, because those are a lot of little fish, commercial is big, so the proportional fishing mortality by the commercial is higher, but when it's all said and done, the wreck is still overwhelming. But the 20 pound fish that you were putting, you that, said was, that, was to con that was to convert our commercial quota into the number of fish we land. Okay, it sounded as if it was, that was the amount of fish, the pounds of fish that were uh, dying. No, if you okay. take our quota, which is uh, 700,000 pounds divided by 19 or 20, you get 45,000. They call us a rock for a commercial fisherman. I was on one of these hearings a few years ago, and there was a big bitch about between the commercial and the recreational guys about taking the, the commercial guys were looking for more quota, and the state was going to give it to them, and the, and the recreational guys went nuts. The same figures were here then about the percentage of the recreational fish that get caught and go back dead at. Being 80, 90 percent, right, 70 percent, where the commercial was only two percent. I think this whole meeting should shift away and forget all about the commercial guys. Leave them alone. What they're doing, <laughs> they're catching fish the way they're supposed to. Their mortality is so freaking small that it shouldn't even be discussed. And we should zero in on the on the non-commercial recreational who are doing all the damage and causing these figures and. Like that, is, but that, like that is the focus of these two yeah. proposals. Well, primarily. if we leave the commercial part out of it, it'll cut this meat in half. Right. <laughs> We're going to get to that next. Yeah. And the other thing is, is I've been fishing for 43 years. You know how many times I've been in this room? A gazillion. <laughs> All I hear is, this model says this. This model says that. 50% of the input we've got in it is all baloney, comes out of a computer. You don't know whether it's fact or fiction, yet Everybody here wants to see this change and see this mortality rate. Right, right, right now, we're dealing with questions on the assessment, so we'll, we'll give you a chance to comment on a specific question. Well, I think we're all done. All right. The data's garbage. The, the, the reality here is this guy has. Yeah, before you say it, let me preach. <laughs> we have to reduce mortality. That's it. You see what's going on at the stock. You all have noticed this fishery is not what it was 10, 15 years ago. 
we have to turn it around. What we're suggesting tonight is a subtle measure that makes you, is it appropriate for commercial? I don't know. We heard a lot of people last night say no. A lot of charter guys said no. The average direct angler is overwhelmingly tell us, no brainer, we should have done this 10 years ago. But we can't sit here and badmouth the science and, and things like that because we're gonna be left behind. Um, the base states will kill us. We need to come in with thinking uh, good ways to reduce mortality. And this is gonna send a signal to the entire coast that we're doing the right thing. Yes. All right. My name is Brian O'Connor. I'm from Rockport. I fished for 30 years. <laughs> All right. I also work in with uh, fishing businesses. I'll give you the 9%. I've heard five, heard seven. Over the year, 100%, 9% mortality rate. Recreational fishing should be targeted overall. Um, I'm not going to argue about the size limit, whatnot. The main people that should be targeted are the rec people, as well as commercial, okay? Because these events you're talking about, we get no founder events, we have commercial guys targeting large fish, we have rec guys targeting, uh, uh, you know, targeting small fish, but I think uh, the catch and release part of it is great, and recreational guys should be targeted around it. Yeah, um, so let's, let's make sure, we will be back here in six months and talk about the division of commercial rent. We don't need that tonight because we can't do anything with it. Tonight, let us know what you think about circle hooks and, and gap. Yes, sir. I don't think, I think it's too hard to uh, regulate the circle hooks and the gap also. Uh, I, I can't see anybody recreational fishing on the gap. I never would. Uh, when I'm commercial fishing, obviously I do. If it's a much louder and especially rough weather. I don't want to be, you know, some side pole for the amount of water I want to fish out of the water. So that gap is really, really important. When it's questionable fish, I would never gap up. Sure. <coughs> Especially on a recreation thing, I would never gap But these things are very hard to, uh, to enforce. Are you going to say that I can't inform a gap and have one aboard my boat? And if I do, how do you know that I want to be on it? Circle looks the same thing. You know, you said you're fishing for blue fish, fish with a striper, I get a striper. When I'm blue fishing and now I get a fine, uh, it seems pretty obvious to me uh, that you need to reduce effort by the recreational fishermen. And that would be by cutting the number of days it's open, just like the commercial. It's not by uh, raising the size limit, because they're just causing more dislike. So you're opposed to both proposals? I'm opposed to both proposals because I don't think the circle. Has law enforcement commented on either one of these proposals, uh, sort of how they would be administered in the field? Why aren't they here? Yeah, they here? Yeah, where's my friend? Uh, they, they should be running. Where is she? This is the state meeting. They, they haven't come. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? They haven't come to you? They, they haven't commented. They were at the meeting last night. We'll have that discussion. They do a good yeah, job. It's right? agreed. <laughs> You know, with 17 guys on the coast, if, if you don't want to circle hook, three of them, 34. If you guys don't want to use circle hooks, I guarantee you don't have to use circle hooks. This is more about education and getting maybe possibly the next generation of anglers know that we use circle hooks. Most of the rec guys I talked to at the shows in the last two months were, they were either, that's a good idea, I already use them, or God, I didn't know about them. And that's more, that's probably more important. Um, and 10 years from now, there'll be big displays in stores, and there'll be a big, we're working with Bass Pro to put a big display with a big bass saying, save bass, use circle hooks. So, we know it's not terribly enforceable, because it's not gonna be selling on your boat. Um, Nor is it probably gonna have a huge reduction on, on release mortality. Some, but It'll have some. You fly guys will continue to kill the fish. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. But you know, everyone points the finger. There's, there's a lot of chunk guys. Well, the guys in my boat are drinking beer while the line is tearing off for 200 yards until I remind them to set the bail. And then they catch it on a circle hook. So there's a role. There's absolutely a role for circle hooks. Um, the debate is is, is it just wrecked? 
So anyway, yes. Hi, I'm Ron Powers from the Water Magazine. Unquestionably, reader-sized fish have been a total free fall for 10 years. Talk to the best of the best people that have to really think long and hard about the 40, 50 pound fish they caught the volume. And they'll tell, they've been saying that for a million years. Uh, we got a blueprint, but we're pretty darn good. Well, I don't see that quite happening back in the 80s when the striper were cracking sinker species, a moratorium. Well, I'm not proposing a moratorium. Clearly said, let me talk, can we finish? In 2011, the year class was extremely healthy, was it not? Now, you were saying, Mike, that those fish are about 34 inches right now? Those are breeders. Those are the those are the future of our strike back fishery. Those fish should be protected, and that should be done immediately. Slot size, something underneath. Somebody wants to keep a fish, whatever, 26 or 28 inches or so. Those fish should be protected. This year it should be raised in fall and the end fall year. Then just like the age, they'll come back for well, 10, 12 glory years of strike bass. It's feeling miserably. We have no spring run anymore. Think of the surf fishermen. There's no spring run. There's, as long as it takes for a cup of coffee to get cool in the fall, there's a slight fall run, only because we've seen a bump in pogies and a bump in peanut butter in the last couple of years or so. We need to protect those breeders. 2011 year class extremely healthy. Those are breeder fish. Can protect I ask them. you to focus on the proposals? So you do anything for us. So you're opposed to the proposals? Absolutely. All right. Even so, can I ask you about the, the moratorium? Sure. What are you referring to? The moratorium in the 80s. Not in this state. Not, huh? mm -hmm. Not in this state. No, kept we had a coastwide moratorium. No, we didn't. Have. No, we didn't. Did no. 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 Well, Chesapeake had a moratorium. I'm totally totally in favor of uh, no, but Thank you. We got your comments. All right. All right. All right. Well, I'm, also <laughs> I'm against both the proposals about the gas and about the circle hooks. I, think, I don't think they're going to make any difference. My suggestion is a strong educational program, either started by the DMF, have seminars where recreational people can go, where you have people who can show them how to take the hook out of the fish, how to better handle a fish. I suggest that this man from the, from the Annual Magazine do an article that spells it all out, how to better handle a striper, how to take a hook out if you have to. Things like this, have the striper clubs, have educational programs that they can, they can have, so it can, through their membership, they can find a lot of people that really don't know how to handle fish, and they can do an immense amount between the state, the magazine, and the striper clubs, I think we can lower that mortality rate by maybe 20% anyway. Thank you. So let me ask, recreational fishing, what's wrong with circle hooks? You lose a fish occasionally. It's recreational fishing. I understand the charter guys. No, they're not used all the time. It's not necessarily. If we made yeah. it mandatory. Hi, I'm Steve Gillette. Um, recreational. recreational angler. No commercial. Um, what's that? Do you commercially fish? No, I don't. Are you uh, your charter captain? No. <laughs> Let's hear what you have to say. Okay. <laughs> recreational anglers, on the whole, over the last few years, it, at least most of the ones that I fish with, I also am a contributor for On the Water magazine, uh, a lot of outlets have been pushing for proper fish handling over the last few years. Um, on the Water has done their part in to try and educate anglers. So it's not a matter of there's not any education out there for recreational anglers. Um, I think recreational anglers on the whole can be a pretty flexible bunch. I'm willing to make changes if circle hooks need to be, if you guys think that that's going to get you the drop in mortality that you need. I personally think it's not quite enough. I agree. Um, I think it's a drop in the bucket as far as what you're going to see. Um, not to get off topic, but the biggest problem that I see is lack of enforcement. Right, yeah, it's I, off topic, but yeah. we want to hear so, from you later on that. Okay. I'm going to go to some okay. for I have a, Actually, one follow-up to the first question that was asked tonight. You said you had people worldwide, people coming in all over the world to do these studies about mortality, and you still can't tell us how you know a fish is dying on the bottom? Nope. <laughs> Was there satellite tags involved? Was it acoustic tag study? I know you guys did the No, but tag we're probably going to do it next year. So what? But we have studies. That this was a, the way the first study was done was, was like a 10 acre pond full of bass. We tag, caught them, tagged them, threw them back, drained the pond. 60 days later, so no time. we counted who was alive and 
towards that. I mean, you yeah. can't get any better than that. Yeah. Well, it all depends that's on the environment of that pond. Yes. You know, yes. But, but we can't we can't so debate that study. That study is going to take the same. Yeah. Yeah. But we can't debate that. I mean, we no. can't. But is it eight? Thirty? You're still at the end of the day. We got to do it. this uh, Steve Baffus, I'm a recreational fisherman, and the last few years they've come out with an inline hook, and I fish, I fish only plugs, I don't bait fish. Um, th that inline hook that they've come out with, DMC and Mustad, they've all come out with a single inline hook to swap out the trebles on our plugs. Has there been any uh, data on any of that? No, uh, no I, not that I know of. I, I would imagine the the hook lip. I mean, artificial yeah. tend not to be the problem because you're not swallowing a, a big right. one. Right, right. The bigger fish can swallow it, but I mean, yeah. for my group, we we try to release everything, and we try to respect the fish. The other thing is, how much I, I know it's you know it gets sometimes contentious between commercial and recreation, but isn't a lot of that recreational uh, mortality just to just due to the sheer volume of recreational anglers versus... Uh, you know what? I, I, you are incredibly insightful. I, I should have mentioned that. <laughs> We're at the point where there's 330 million people in the U.S., <laughs> and most of them live on the coast. And so I don't know how many fish bass on the East Coast, 10 million, 20 million. We are fully exploited. The day, the, the, the January 1st, we have enough people to fully exploit the stock. We could get rid of commercial fisheries, and we'd still be right at the edge, probably, of commercial uh, of overfishing. So that's why it's so difficult. You can see that number. There's nothing wrong with 50% of being dead. Right. It means we're having a ball um, with a great fishery. And what we're saying is, let's start trying to get that down. And education for handling and all that is. We've been doing that also, and a lot of, a lot of people have. And I know on the waters coming up with it. And, article about all that. Yeah, just real quick, uh, recreational, they fish like seven days a week. Commercial fish two days a week. Would it help to slow down the uh, recreational tourism? The, the effort seven days a week? No one we more can, thing is the gas. One sure. more thing. Quick one. We, one thing. we can't take you off the water. I know. We're a catch and release fishery. Most yeah, people don't bring the fish home at the end of the day. And so we can close the whole week and our discard mortality will be exactly like on the gas, like a commercial fish, and all the guys that I know around Wausau to Boston, uh, if they think the fish is not close to being uh, illegal, they just grab by the hand. They, put, no, they, they never gaff them, never, never, never saw one in all my years of fishing. So the commercial guys find the gas, but we only use that when we know for sure it's a commercial fish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Al Williams from Gloucester again. Mike, with regard to the proposals, um, I am opposed to removing gaps. I think there's a place for gaps both with the commercial fishery and the recreational fishery. My concerns there are primarily safety. Um, you know, as we move away from gaps, our option becomes landing nets, which I find cumbersome and unwieldy, especially at night, and they pose entanglement problems when you're fishing with plugs. They are just much more difficult to use than a gap, especially at night when you're fishing alone. That leaves us with the lipping mechanisms, the plastic lippers or the boga grip type devices. Now I have to lean over the rail and engage that striker at water's level, at night, in the dark, under sometimes sketchy sea conditions. Again, those are significant safety issues from a boating perspective. Um, I've done a lot of shore fishing for striped bass over the years as well. I don't do it anymore, but we've got some outcroppings around Cape Ann where these fellows fish that are very, very sketchy in the fall with a high surf and white water. And I see them using gaffs very responsibly. They get down there, they pick their spot, they look at that fish, they get it up and they get it released. I don't see the misuse of gaffs that seem to be driving this proposal, which lacks data. So. I don't see this as an issue, and I'm opposed to removing gas from the equation. On the circle hook thing, um, I don't find circle hooks as efficient and as effective in gaining purchase in a fish or hooking up than I do J hooks or treble hooks when fishing large live baits. Now, north of the Cape and through the Gulf of Maine, 
we've got a tremendous volume of pogies that are migrating up here. So one of the preferred baits when we're commercial fishing and when I'm recreational fishing is these very large pogies and very large mackerel. And when I fish circle hooks with those, I don't get the great or dependable hookup ratio that I do when I'm using J hooks or treble hook rigs or other terminal tackle that I employ when I'm fishing these large live baits. So my proposal with regard to circle hooks is yes for the recreational fishery, no for the commercial fishery. Because as you stated earlier, when I'm recreational fishing, I really don't have quite the emotional attachment to landing that fish. If I don't get the hook up and that hook pulls, that's fine. But when I'm commercial fishing, I am trying to target only the bigger fish, greater than 34 inches, and I want to be as efficient in that fishing activity as I can be. Thank you. Rick. Mark Fulton. We talked about this in 1999. Glad to see we were visiting it. Glad to see by the numbers in this. It's only gone up 1% from 8 to 9 as an average. Same exact study. You can read this if you want. Exactly the same as what you're saying now. I did my own study with circle hooks. After all this, I sat on the advisory board for two years. Circle hooks are wonderful in field fishing. You're not bad if you keep a clam on it, just put it up. You're all right with some tinker mackerel. They're useless with bogeys. They're useless with horse mackerel. They're useless for most of the big chunks. Now you get so so size chunk that's all right. Yeah. I fished with both of them now since '99, and I can't find any difference. And just I know just for the sake of saying this, because this very first fish I ever caught on a circle hook, I caught with a three foot leader, and I had four inches of the leader sticking out of that fish's mouth. I could have caught that fish, I know, on a naked snap because it would trying to exit the south end of that fish. But I know for a fact that every hundred fish I catch when I was J-hook fishing, I know I was letting somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six fish go, we're probably gonna die. I'll go with the circle hook thing. I don't have an opinion on the gap. I've been a, I've been a bow to grip guy for a long while and I've been a surf guy. I get the boat twice a year. People write about it for some stupid reason. They're more inclined to see me on the rock somewhere and surprised to see me in the boat. Well, I don't really have an opinion on the gap. It's of no use to me. If I don't have the boga grip, I'll shove my hand into its mouth and put it in if I need to. I don't think you're going to see the results you're hoping for with the circle hooks, but I'm certainly not opposed to it. Yes, sir. Good evening, Ron Sherman. I'm a recreational here in Boston, and I am for both proposals. Um, as a recreational fisherman, I do it for fun, and even if these proposals stay big, I just don't consider killing fish fun. So why not do everything you can to try to save as many fish as you can, even if it's a small percentage? Thank you. Um, my name is Mike Carroll, and I'm the of Captain in Boston. I'm also um, very familiar with the island in part of it, and a lot of the uncertainty, which I think you are talking about with the MRF data and the model. Um, so I would, I'm a boat to hold global, and I think, you know, the thought process is with that level of uncertainty with the models, why take measures like this, which don't really, I mean, from what I've heard, they're not really proven to be effective. You know, why not go more with what this gentleman right here mentioned with an educational program with the recreational fishery that lacks understanding on handling these fish and on hooking these fish. You go to get your permit, your $11 permit, why not have a video with a quiz before you get the permit? You have to watch it and you have to understand it. Why not have something that is, deals directly with that mortality issue opposed to trying to put this in place, trying to enforce it? I mean, it's just too complicated. It's my thought process for something where three years from now, you're like, oh, the MRED data was wrong anyways. And also, and so my thought process is, you know, and I've done things like this, looking at this stuff and understood and said, you know, let's not take radical measures right now. Let's, you know, let's try to adjust the problem, but 
I, I just think you're pushing for something that you're not going to get. You're not going to get the results you want. My name is Mike Delfingo. I own a fish bucket out of Boston. I'm charter boat and I commercial bass fish, and I'm opposed to both of these proposals. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, circle hooks on a charter boat with large baits really have no place. We use them if they if it's a, if it calls for, like with tinker mackerel, if you're uh, you know throwing them into the rocks or something. But trolling fogies offshore with a circle hook is not going to catch fish. Uh, I would also, like this gentleman proposed, an educational program where when people go in the tackle shop to buy chunk, they can't buy J hooks. They only can buy circle hooks. So educate the tackle shops on what hooks they're selling to these true recreational anglers that don't know how to handle these fish. Gaff on a charter boat, the mate is the one doing the gaffing, not the, not the customer, the recreational angler. The mate knows if that fish is gaffable or not. The mate knows if we have a limit, if that fish should be netted. But that first fish that's coming over the rail that these customers want meat is going to get the gap in it. If we have a limit, we can switch to the circle hooks, we can switch to the hooks. But to, to paint everybody with the same broad brush of circle hooks with any type of live bait, I don't think it's reasonable. Uh, if you want to. Get, commercial fishermen are going to gaff fish. I see the dead discards at the rigs. Everybody gaffs everything down there. If you want to lower the commercial dead fish discards, discards lower the size limit an inch. All right. There would be a lot less 33 inch floating dead fish at the rigs. Is there anyone we haven't? Heard from before we start going back to the same. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Peter Schwenner from the Cape. Uh, I've been fishing since the 40s, and uh, well, there were times that I wasn't, but I uh, do both fishing and I do commercial and gathering. I've used nothing but circle hook in the last 15 years, and I don't think I got gaffed a fish. Uh, one fish I can remember gaffing in the last 10 15 years. Look at a lot of fish. And uh, all the smaller fish get netted. So I think the, 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 the gentleman talking about fishing at night with big fish, you've got a gap because the only way you're going to get them aboard safely. But in terms of circle hooks, uh, I don't fish with really big baits, so maybe that's a, that's a factor. But I found that my hookup ratio is higher with the circle hooks. You don't have to be a strong fisherman to, to catch a fish with a circle hook. Kind of help themselves. It's my, it's my opinion. Thank you. So, uh, Captain Brian Cruz out of Boston Hollow. Um, so, especially with the recreational guys, I, I think everyone in this room can agree that everyone knows how to fish. With the rec guys, it's probably 60% of them that go out, you know, one day a week at best that really might not be the best fish in it. And, and the use of the circle for them especially, that's really what you guys need to be targeting as far as, like, like you said, the informational thing, but also, you know, the, the mandatory circle, because these are the guys that are going to be duck up and fish or mishandling a fish. This is really where, especially that sector where you have that large population that doesn't know how to fish correctly, maybe that's, that's really where the fish should be focused on the most. Everyone already. I, I was going to say I support both proposals, but I can see exemptions for commercial and for hire. Thank you. Um, I just want to kind of touch on what Mike said about uh, trolling off, not offshore, but trolling in deep water for bass. In Boston, we have a different fishery than the Cape. We do a lot of trolling with big baits, and that's acting like a lure. So that category really, you know, I oppose the circle. We're offshore trolling. Sure. Yeah. We're, not, we're not sitting and drifting our baits. They're, they're moving at two knots. I, think. I didn't speak to this yet. Yeah. I, I just asked you question science. Back on that switch. 
I, um, I'm opposed to both of them. Um, as far as trying to reduce the number of dead fish, I think you're better off trying to do something with reducing the size of the recreational catch, meaning the smaller size that they're able to take so that they don't continue to fish. And I think that should also be part of it is once you retain a fish, your fishing should cease for that day because it seems like catch and release is what the problem is. People are catching an exorbitant amount of fish that they can't take, they're throwing it back and they're not taking it. What if you don't take a fish? Huh? So what if you well, don't take a fish? Then you just keep fishing, unfortunately, <laughs> but there's no control over that. Okay. But all I'm saying is once you maintain a fish in your possession, you shouldn't be able to continue to fish. And so. that's really worked out well. Right. Yeah, thanks. So, so I, I think, uh, Rob Savino, I, I run a charter boat out of Boston. I follow fisheries and rules and regulations quite a bit. Um, I was involved when, or not involved, but I, I followed when surf hooks were introduced. And, and I've been fishing a long time, 35 plus years. Um, I think there's a lot of questions that are popping up. And I think the one, one big thing that we keep coming back to is education. And I think the folks in this room aren't necessarily your, your target audience to give them education because they know how to handle fish with probably a lower mortality, right? Um, so so my, my take would be, before we start regulating hooks and gear and things like that, let's first get them up to speed on education, and maybe we'll see a bit of a mortality. And the reason why I say it is I am against the circle hooks. However, I fish circle hooks all the time. But I fish them in certain applications. I fish them with chunk bait, I fish them with certain live baits that are smaller, things of that nature. And there is a catch difference between circle hooks and other types of hooks, J hooks, treble hooks, whatever, right? Um, so, so I'm not sure that you're gonna get, like we're hearing, the desired results on the circle hook, which, which leads me to really more of the difficult problems on the enforcement side of things of this, because now, the Department of Marine Fisheries has to define what is a legitimate, qualified circle hook, right? So you have to determine whether it's an octopus, which an octopus will definitely duck hook a lot more than, let's say, a mustad circle hook, which is the pictures that you had up there, right? So, so the, the interesting thing is, is now you've got to educate the recreational angler to go and say, you've got to use this specific hook. Right? So I think if you do legislation like this, just like the fin cutting legislation that I mentioned a couple years back, is you're going to end up catching people with a fine that don't know any better. So let's get more of a PSA going and do some public service announcements and, and do um, a little bit more on educating people. That's for sure. Um, I question the numbers, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll give guys some sense of their numbers if everybody wants to think about their catch and release numbers on whether the science is right or not. We have to assume the science is right because we have to reduce it. So my, my, my solution on reduction may be different than what they got. But real quick, if you look at a million dead bass is what he's talking about on the 13 million. That equates to 600, uh, 167,000 a month is released dead, right? So that equates to 5,600 fish a day. As an average through a six month period of fish dying as a dead discard. To me, that seems very high. Because now if you have one day where you have rough water, then it may not necessarily be 5,600. So the science is definitely questionable. And my thing is, is why start restricting people on hooks and put regulations in that we're not 100% sure is going to be the desired result one. It will definitely reduce mortality because it's going to reduce the hookup of fish. I give you that. Um, I, I would urge you guys, don't take away these, these any, any kind of hook right more than educate because of the logistics of educating the poor guy who's going to go up to a bridge with a pole and want to catch a fish, he comes up with a circle up, and the EPO comes on him and says, hey, you're in, you're in fine, so now you get a fine, you know. I mean, these are things that we're trying to prevent, and, and that's not the desired result that we're looking for, the recreational guys getting fined by the EPO. We're looking for it to reduce mortality. 
and education is one of the huge ones. Then we can debate whether circle books are effective over tables, things like that, with fishing techniques and stuff of that nature. Um, as far as the gaffing of fish, my understanding of the gaffing is this is all coming from people who are fishing down the Cape Cod Canal, who are happen to see, there goes a fish floating by, and are saying it's gaffing of fish. I think you have more problems than gaffing of fish, more than it may be a cully of fish, right? So the guy down the Cape Cod just gaffed himself a 28 inch, or he's gonna keep this, and then he stays fishing, gets a bigger fish, and he's culling it. That's probably where you're hearing all of this. Go ahead. Actually, we, we did get complaints off the Chatham area where there was a lot of daytime commercial fishing and people watching each other and seeing people gaffing and releasing undersized fish. So we have gotten those reports. It, this is not about the commercial. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then, then on that aspect, I'm going to go back again with let's educate these folks on the gaff. I mean, I, I can tell you right now, I can gaff fish right there in the tail, in, in the lip and know exactly the size within a quarter of an inch before you oh, your approach. Exactly. But what I'm getting at is, is I am also arguing about don't restrict a fisherman on how he wants to fish with hooks and things like that. More than let's focus on the fish itself and see if we can do something with that. Education, let's see if we can get people on. So I, I, I would I really cautious you you know caution you guys yeah, about this. Because it, it could be a, a problem. Your folks. Suppose, and this is their own hope. Sorry, guys, you're free to do whatever you want. Gap, any book you want. Commercial guys, do whatever you want. Now come. Most of what we've heard is flavored because you're a charter captain or a commercial. 300 ang, 1,000 anglers are out there catching fish. Well, we're educated. Yeah. My, my, question was, yes, my, my question really quickly is, does a circle hook necessarily reduce that million, do, million amounts of fish? Because how many people are actually fishing with, how many, if you affected the circle hook, would, be re would result to fishing mortality decreasing? And my thought is, is it's more lures. For recreational angling. What's that? What's the downside? He pops a bait out of their mouth a couple times a day. I, so I want to focus on no, the No, no, the downside pounds. really, for me the downside really is, is the guy who's sitting on the rocks with a J-hook trying to catch a fish and gets pinched by the EPO. You the bought a license. You know, know, to know I, mean, but I understand that, but, but that's not necessarily mean guys, that's a good law. You guys to be coached. You're not going to be writing up everyone. That's not true, Mike. I got pinned I think by the environmental I, pain. Yeah, great. I think what you're going to have is these guys here, it's a tool for the gaff, but they're, the gaff is, I know the guys you're referring to, but the gaff has slowly disappeared from the shore, and you'll have guys, recreational guys, you'll share, I'll go to Jersey, I'll come up here, they're like, is that guy carrying a gaff? It's this, it, yeah, and you hear the chuckling. It's a non-existent non right? tool, and the only reason you see the gaff on the shore is on education. But for the guys on the boat, I'll have to give them credit. At night, yes, you need the gaff. To get a customer out of the way, you need the gaff. So you might run into that problem. The commercial guys aren't the problem. The commercial They're educated. Guys, they know yeah. how to use a gaff. Yeah, but from a shore, you might get rid of the gaff. All right. So that's a germane comment. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. So I participate in all six recreational, charter, and commercial. And I understand that you really want to focus specifically on this one circle of issue, and let's do that. We were asking, okay, remove commercial, remove charter captains, and let's go just to recreational. And you showed the data of what was, what was dead from recreational release to die. Is that at all, if you remove charter from that, is that data at all differentiated between how much of that recreational is caught on a charter boat anyway versus caught from a recreational angler that is not on a charter boat? Because that must be considered recreational, correct? Right? Well, no, it's counted for separately. So we do know what it is. And it's probably 10% of it. 10% of the recreational was on charter charter boat. Yeah. But it lumped in that same data that we saw, still was part yes. of what you call recreational. Yes. Okay. So, okay. I mean, we could eliminate charter from this if we chose, weighing all the data. 
and it would reduce our benefit, but, but we still have a huge benefit. So you believe that with the use of circle hooks, that would potentially help 90% of what you saw from the recreational fishing that's are exactly right off the top of my head, but it's close. Yeah. So it should still I can't, I can't, I can't believe that figure because because what you're saying is that that everybody's fishing with bait and chunks and 90% of the rec staff are fishing with artificials. That's I didn't say that at all. But but you just said that 90% of that total would be saved by using circle hooks. Well, the, I, so that what you're saying is 90% is everybody using bait? 90% is from the rec anglers, not charter, not commercial. Right. So what part of that yeah, would be that, saved? Some are circles. using artificial, some are doing other things. Right. And so, yes, the benefit is lower. But I, I'm still, I don't, I haven't heard why an angler on shore, how it's so terrible to miss a hookup while you're fishing all day long, not what's called fish on. Not, it's not, it's not, not, it's not, not so why can't you put the circle hook in now instead of waiting for another year? We want we want the, it's the tackle shops need to come up to speed. Right? I mean, with that's digs not, and, and no, that's, that's that's don't have them available, the available order, then we'll get people being illegal. Yes, sir. Mike, if you don't put this in, you got Mark a little bit. And honestly, we talk a lot about chum fishing, eel fishing, whatever you want. The guys can run. I pretty much sided with commercial guys for the last 30 years. And I'm probably one of the few recreational guys who will stand here and say that. Because their numbers are pretty true. I can pick out one or two bad apples. That doesn't make them all bones. I can pick out plenty of guys on the recreational side. I've watched prior to many football drop bass back into the water. The other issue we aren't even talking about here, and I believe is the bigger issue, we can do circle hooks all we want, but there's far too many people, the majority of their fishing is plug fishing. And I can point you to plenty of people any given day in the summer off of Marblehead, Salem, and Swanscott plug fishing as well as bait fishing. And they're catching fish on plugs and as fast as they come in the boat, they go flying back over and times like that, times like that, but most of the time like that. That's a part of the problem that circle hooks are not going to fix. Since the on the, on the topic of record, getting away from commercial guys for a minute, on the topic of recreational anglers and hooks, the, one of the biggest problems, again, is back to lack of education. And anglers, like, what about anglers with unattended rods? How many guys do you see down on the beach that have a, a, a rod and a sand spike, and they have had a fish on for five, ten minutes before they realize it? And then, you know, that it, it's stuff like that. It's people... Um, not using, you know, I for one, I do plenty of fishing with octopus hooks for eel, uh, with, with eels at night. It's a very active form of fishing. As soon as you know you have a hit, you know, you're, you're letting that rod down, you're setting the hook within seconds. If you, you know, you miss the fish, you miss the fish. But you're not letting that fish go off with your bait for 30, 40 seconds before you even notice it. So. It, you know, you can, you, we need to educate people on the right type of hook to use in the right situation. Um, if you're going to be bait fishing, you shouldn't be leaving your rod for an extended period of time. You should be actively, actively fishing with that rod. So. Thank you. To piggyback uh, off of Steve, uh, how about those guys that have four or five rods sitting out there on the beach? <laughs> I mean, they, they could be getting fish well, on those. And, yeah. You know. So stay with the circle. You're right. working in the circle. That's begging for circle. That's begging. You're not circle. gonna. You're not gonna teach people not to have a good time on the beach. And four but what I'm saying is a blanket, a blanket coverage of circle Even hooks circle. is not. So, right, so right, here on the circle hook thing is uh, everybody says education, education. I'm also a hunter as well. I have to go through hunter education courses. Why can't there be some kind of education when you buy your permit that you understand you need to have? 
whatever it is, circle hooks, and you have to have no gaff and things like that with uh, education. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just my last thought on the gaff here, Mike. Right um, if, if we're not having a discussion with regard to cod on the gaffs, we, we can't be having a discussion on strikers. Um, you know, the cod fishery in this in the Gulf of Maine is is in dire straits to the point where you've got only a recreational fishery for cod that's catch and release in state waters, yet we're having no discussion about gaffing these 15 to 25 pound market cod that are prevalent within state waters. I mean, to me, it, it seems like that discussion should have come up at least with, if not before, a discussion on gaffing strike gaff. All right, the final word, <laughs> Mike, the words of wisdom. One thing that I heard here, and I have heard from the guys in Marblehead, some of the guys talking in Boston, I say that better than 50% of the fisheries that I see in, in the upper Cape Ann, Rockport, toward the Lane, up toward Anaswan area on that side, I say 75% of those people are fishing with lures, with plugs, with treble hooks. They're not using bait, and so they're not going to have to deal with circle hooks. Well, I think I think right now beating the circle hook thing, I think, is a joke. I don't think it's going to make enough difference to reduce the, the, the whole thing by any means and, and to make it a regulation where you really don't think that it's going to make a big difference. I think you got to just skip it from that point. And the other thing is, I've heard from people, whether it's recreational or whatever, people go fishing, and I've heard people say, well, if you got a circle hook, you might lose a fish. Okay? You, might lose, you might not catch it. People go fishing to catch a fish. Whether you it's for fun to catch it, or, or you enjoy the, the fight and the pleasure, or you actually want to take it home and eat it. You want to catch the fish. You don't want it getting away. And the people of Massachusetts should be able to catch and keep as many possible fish when they're here in our waters. And that's what you guys are charged to do. You're not charged to save fish so it goes back to Rhode Island and down to Maryland so they can have a bigger fish. That's what's written for us. <laughs> Quickly, I don't think anybody in this room has an issue with the shore based circle hook rule. Yeah, no one has an issue. No issue. Okay. Uh, or Thank even, you or even your... boat, boat based dead bait. Because that's usually perfectly fine. In fact, I think a lot of people have an issue, like they said, when they're fishing the larger live bait. Okay. From the next. And that's what we wanted to hear. <laughs> How many and, of the fishermen actually own boats? Yes. All, all right, the next topic have to do with the commercial say, We have, um, we have <laughs> proposed. The first slide <laughs> has to do with the recent performance. Uh, that makes we have sense, the year right? the core of the landing. The quarters uh, seem to change a little bit, but that's mainly attributable in the first couple of years to overages. So we take off the following year the, ex the excessive uh, landings to the quarter. Um, the, the quarters were reduced in 2015, um, and, and we were pretty good at catching the quarter until this past year, 2018, uh, when we did not. Um, some of the things that have happened over the past couple of years is we've gotten more, uh, the law enforcement's gotten more aggressive about enforcing the, the uh, commercial limits. There's been a lot more effort, especially down in the Cape Cod area. Uh, some, some poaching was going on. We've also limited the, the number of fish you can take commercially from shore up to two. Um, we have the, the uh, fin clipping rule so that people aren't uh, uh, stockpiling uh, in advance of the open fishing day. So we think that all attributed to uh, us not reaching the quarter. In addition to the issues that Mike talked about, which is the lack of, of some bigger fish because of the downturn in the, in the large fish. Here's just some statistics and, and story read uh, is here tonight, head of our statistics program, along with Anna Webb, and they generate these, uh, these graphs, and so you can see the fishing performance. Um, in 2013, uh, we, we closed uh, that, that fishery uh, pretty quickly in a matter of, of about a month and a half. Um, in 14, we went a little bit longer, and you can see the, the value sort of uh, peaked there in 14, we had uh, the high landings. Uh, 4.75 million was the ex vessel value. In 15, 3.58. 16, 3.8. Um, past two years, it's interesting. We had 3.3 million. 
And even though the, the ladies were down 18, the, the fish were actually worth more in aggregate to the commercial sector. Uh, so the, just a quick summary, uh, in 2018, we left about 11% of the quarter on the table. Uh, oh, I, we also um, eliminated last year commercial striped bass fishing on around the 4th of July and Labor Day. And this re, uh, came from requests from some of the harbor masters who uh, found that on, on those holidays, uh, people couldn't use the boat ramps because the places were just jammed full of uh, commercial bass fishing uh, boats and trailers, or uh, trailers and trucks um, because it's an open fishing day. So uh, they requested that. Uh, we didn't get much pushback from the dealers because they didn't really want to send trucks down on the 4th of July anyway. <coughs> but anyway, so we, we felt that given those, those <coughs> fishing days away also contributed to our inability to take it. Um, so here are the proposals. We were talking about uh, a slightly earlier opening as early as June 13th, adjust the fin clipping rule commensurate with that. And then there's another proposal to change uh, the Thursday open fishing day uh, with Wednesday. Uh, the rationale is to provide the additional access to the quarter uh, early in the season, um, to mitigate the loss of the 4th of July and Labor Day. And uh, this, is a, this is an issue that's uh, mainly coming from some of the South Coast fishermen. Uh, we have black sea bass open fishing days of Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and striped bass is Monday and Thursday, and the folks who do both uh, requested that we move that open fishing day to Wednesday. Um, so I guess we don't have that other, that other calendar. But anyway, okay, so so those, those are the proposals. Uh, what's, you what do you have, folks have the calendar on Monday, and I think everyone should see the yeah. Because I wanted to talk about that calendar shot. I, want, I, I wanted to talk about Monday, but I got okay. passed on it. I don't know what I have on this deck. So. Okay. So why don't we um, why don't we get into the So this calendar, I put this together to sort of portray what we're proposing here. So the current season opening is on the 23rd uh, by regulation, but the open fishing days are Monday and Thursday. So if we move the season back as soon as June 13th, then we could have a Thursday the 13th, Monday the 17th, Thursday the 20th, etc. And the second part of the proposal, if we move the Thursday fishing day to Wednesday, then we would, we would open with on the 17th and then go to the 19th, 24th, and 26th. So you already have an idea about that. So uh, myself, I got primarily uh, May and June. I got primarily on Cape Cod. I don't I don't come north of the Cape usually until the end of June. Usually on opening of commercial season, I kind of settle back into Boston Harbor. The fishing is spectacular on Cape Cod in early spring. You have large biomass of the fish. Define early spring? Uh, early spring, usually from like second week of May all the way to like <coughs> third to fourth week of June. Okay. That's when you have large biomass of the fish all crammed together, uh -huh. stacked on top of one another. And that's when the most fish can be caught all at once. That's when opening up a commercial day on Cape Cod, where you have three to four hundred boats that sit on top of these large biomass of fish, that's where you're going to see all these fish taken all at once. Yeah, they'll fill the quota. Those fish will never make it to Boston. They'll never make it to Maine. So you're opposed to I'm it. completely opposed to it as a guy. Both as aspects, the moving the days and the, the early opening? The, the moving the day, moving the early opening. Okay. Those, early those, those, especially with the new electronics now, yeah. 
uh, when those fish are in those large biomasses, mm -hmm. they're very easy to catch. Okay. Uh, so by doing that, a large portion of the quota will not only be filled then by those Cape okay. guys, which many of them aren't, aren't even uh, from Massachusetts. Many of them are from out of state. Okay. So what winds up happening is those fish won't even make it to anyone in this room. Right. Recreation or just. That's a strong point. And we also got a good comment the other night where and the folks who talked about this, who also opposed it, said that, um, that if the quota goes down next year, then maybe some of this is moved. We, but we crafted these ideas way before we yes. got the assessment from us. Coming from fishermen, yeah. seeing how much life there is on those weeks, yeah. those are like prime weeks for me. Yeah. To, to be able to have commercial fishing on those weeks is really going to hurt the okay. stocks. Does, does anyone disagree with that? That's, no, you that's make really agree. I fully agree. Fully agree. Yeah, that's, that's fully agree. agree. No, is that the general consensus? You don't want to see this fishery over there? I, I, I don't want to see it over there. All right. That's, that's a bad idea. We can do it right now. Yes. Go ahead. Anybody opposed? Anybody yeah. who would like to see the fishery over there? Why the move from Thursday to Wednesday? Well, again, um, it's the relationship between the black sea bass fishery, which opens in, in uh, July. Um, with those of the free open fishing days there, it's Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. Those guys who fish in both said, well, I can't do sea bass and striped bass for the same day. They've asked us to consider this. So, we're going to get it. We're, we're sticking on the early opening. The consensus of this group is not to do it. Correct. That after, uh, Correct. Correct. And what about moving the day? If you get three days and we get two, That's good why, why move us. it? Why right. move us? Is there any support for moving that day in this room? Mike. Yeah, Al? Uh, just you know, I defer that to the buyers. If if they see a better opportunity to fulfill their requirements and enhance the price by moving it one day, it, okay, I would, well, we didn't for I would support for purposes of price enhancement. We thought it would be neutral. Okay, but I oh, yeah, know, two, year, two years ago we two years ago the buyers did come out and say that yeah. Monday and Thursday that's were true. their preferred day. We consulted the buyers on this before we floated it. And they did not have anything negative to say about it. But I'm not saying that that's why we did it. But yes, Al. So just to finish my thought on not opening the season early, I want to see the season, the quota managed the same way it was last year. Open it on a traditional date on the 24th. But as we get the late August and early September, if we're coming up short, add a third day. Um, during the, yeah, we third react the week again. Did you have work that on the record? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's important for you to advise us on that because yes. if we get that kind of a comment at a hearing like this, then it sort of puts the ball in play and we can go back and we can make that proposal as we serve our regulation, final regs up the chain of command. I thought that was an outstanding way to manage the program. Right, thank you. Yes. Uh, I would make the recommendation to open that Sundays back up because the way it is now with only during the week, it eliminates the people that aren't full-time commercial only fishermen. And this is not a commercial only fisherman fisher. Anyone is, has access to this fishery, but eliminating the weekends eliminates a lot of people like me. I have a full-time job, but I, I charter my boat, I commercial fish whenever I can, but I, you know, I'm, I don't have access to these fish. You're taking away my access with removing the Sundays and you're catering, now you're catering to the guys down the oh. Cape who want a black sea bass on Thursdays. Well, yeah, we're catering them, we're proposing them because that's something. Well, if it passes, fish. you would be catering to them. That's fair. We don't have a black sea bass fish. Okay. Yes. And, 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 so jump on that, they have three days. Uh -huh. So really, we should be catered to. Let them change the day. And I, and, and I, uh, you know, I really think that's going to affect the price movement to Wednesday. But now you're a weekend fish to the consumer, it's not a weekend fish. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, my fish. I would, I would propose instead of the, the Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, all this stuff, to rotate the two days a week. <laughs> move around so that there's more access, like this fellow said here. Move, move the two days here and there so there's more access. So more people can access this fishery, but like he says, you know, half of the commercial fishermen my only my only thing on this is, is watch the watch the quota a little tighter than we did this past year 
because we clearly saw the quota, or at least I did, the quota wasn't going to be hit last year. Well, in August and September, I saw it wasn't going to be hit. And so if we see that, maybe we split it up to maybe separate it up to more months where you guys know it within internally that we want to catch this amount of quota this month, this month. And if you see we're not hitting that quota, then let's maybe change it sooner to make the quota. Yeah, so and, and, and for the record, I, I don't commercial fish that anymore. So all. let me let me point out some of the challenges. Look at 2017. We had a that you can't see the axis, but that's a hundred thousand pounds in one day. So there's the problem is that if we were throwing this fleet and say, well, we're not doing too well, what would happen for the very end? So it's dicey. You know, you use last week's results to forecast next week's closure open. So I hear you, but I'm just saying it's it's a little more challenging than you think when you have this kind of variability. But the dealers can definitely give you a sense on how it's coming. Well, we do. We talk to the dealers all the time. When we get quotes like that, Aaron and the staff are calling those dealers every day. Yeah. We also need the commission to vote on any quotes for just two days. So if you're looking at a late late August change, that's not going to be approved until after the September commission meeting, which is usually the week after Labor Day. Oh, well, Atlantic States have to approve this? No, we no, are our marine fishery. Oh, you're a marine fishery? So why don't you make that proposal now or how and have it in but place? You don't have any emergency yeah. proposal you can pop into place without having to do that? Yeah. How hard is it to close it? By a certain time, the proposal is already there. All right, we'll take a look at that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, hey, Dan, the quote yes. is also going to be higher than in 2019 because it will roll down. No, you don't. You don't roll under. Uh, okay. Um, anybody interested in talking about scuffing black sea bass party board fishing? Part of the second proposal, which is liberalizing. Oh yes, yes. Thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you, Mike. All right. So, so this proposal um, comes from the agency and it was presented to us by the state of Maryland who came to us um, pointing out that our fish is on the Maryland markets, um, you know, especially our big fish, which is non-compliant with many of their fishing rules. Um, they don't have any kind of uh, rule like we do where during our open commercial season, if the fish isn't uh, 34 inches or larger, it can't be in our markets. Um, the striped bass tagging program, which is mandated by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, at this point is really the gold standard of, of tagging and fish, uh, origin of fish, uh, uh, fish accountability. Even more so in the state of Maryland because they have uh, ITQs, they have tags that are issued to individual fishermen, and the fishermen themselves tag the fish on the water. Unlike in this state where the fish are tagged by the dealers, in Maryland they're tagged on, on, the, on the water by the, by the commercial fishermen. So they brought it to our attention, um, and they brought it to their own uh, attorney general's attention saying, hey, can we exclude Massachusetts fish from our markets? And they said no. Unless there's a substantial enforcement reason that, uh, like for example, you can do it in in lobster. You can keep you know so, uh, undecided lobsters out from PEI because it's too easy to commingle them. But in the case of striped bass, because every fish bears an individual tag that is put on that fish by the commercial fisherman in that home state, especially in Maryland, um, uh, it's the, the enforcement challenge is just not there. So. The Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission Law Enforcement Committee took a look at this. It was presented to them, and they, and they said, okay, well, what do you think? And all the officers who served on that committee said, we don't see an enforcement challenge here. So we're here to propose to lift the Massachusetts rule. Uh, right now, these fish can come in um, year-round. In fact, they do. Um, it's just during our open commercial season that we are restricting those, and we're proposing to lift that restriction. Why? Uh, let me repeat that. No, 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 I know. Is it just to satisfy Maryland? Well, yeah. Look, Mike? So the nice problem is it's a net fish, I mean, they can also sell the um, product a lot cheaper the than The point is that the, right, yeah. under the U.S. Constitution, I'm not a lawyer, I spent yeah. a lot of time with that. <laughs> it's, it's not lawful to set up 
uh, rules for purposes of protecting home markets or giving local fishermen a better price for their fish. It, it won't survive a court challenge. We have a seafood marketing program. We're working with other states to promote wild caught seafood. Believe me, if, if Maryland ever did say, I'm sorry, you're not gonna bring those fish in because my, our guys need a better price for their local caught fish, we'd be all over them in a heartbeat. And so out of, out of fairness and out of, you know, in sort of in, uh, in respect of the Constitution and the Commerce Clause, that's why. So that's our proposal. We don't think it's gonna have a big effect on the market because those fish are already available nine and a half months a year, and we're not really seeing them in our market. You know what I mean, we don't see that many, but as a principle, we've been asked to examine this and we're proposing today to repeal that thing. So I think the statement was made that we'd rather eat a 22, 25 inch fish than a 34 inch fish, right? So while we're catching 34 inch fish, and selling those, and you've got the flood of 26 inch fish or slot fish coming in, um, A, it may be a better tasting fish, and it's going to, de I think it's going to decrease the cost of the fish that we're selling. And, and, and I know that might not be constitutional, but I do think it's unfair to have us be fishing for something different than somebody else is at the same time frame in the same fishery, well in the same, it's all mixed, but nevertheless, it puts us at a disadvantage. Um. I'm not seeing a lot of those fish in our restaurants now during the winter, or during winter, spring, and fall. Seeing them in the market still, I'm seeing them. I'm seeing the small 20 inch plus size now. fish now. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've seen them in the market. All right, Mike, I want to hear from you. You know, from the fish market. So, how much, uh, you know, what's the regulations with the bag and carry through the supply chain? How far does it get? It has to go. Lots of fish gets filleted in portions. I think it has to go all the way to the uh, final set. Final set. So, so is it in the fish case? Is that tag next to a filet? It has to. It's supposed to be wrapped up in maybe a Ziploc bag or something. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what this is also about is some dealers want to bring these fish up here and then so like some of our processors process it and then send it out nationally or internationally. And some of our fish processors uh, have those markets. But in the, in the summertime, they can't bring those fish in. Yeah, I was just thinking that within the fish case, when the fish is processed, there's just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity there for stuff to get filmed with it. That's illegal. What would you be filming? What would be illegal? Domestic fish from here, from this state. Oh, okay. what, if there were, what if there was a fish market or a restaurant and they were able to, okay, well, we're allowed to have this fish. We have this tag from this Maryland fish. Oh, we'll just put it over here. Here it goes. Yeah. But like, they still have to get those, that illegal fish from the shore, or from onto the shore, onto the road. Yeah. <laughs> but they wouldn't have a tag. I mean, the fish have to be tagged. Yeah, but what if they had their own fish already? All right. Well, then you're pointing out they may be in a force of What's the worst that happens if we don't do this? If we don't allow. We upset our no, no, we probably get sued. <laughs> That's it. We got to tie up the board. And why haven't we been sued yet? Uh, well, there's a lot of things that, that may not be legal until people wake up about it. Don't change change it unless it's broken. <laughs> well, again, I'm, I'm not looking to change this. It was brought to our attention asking us to look at this because they're they're looking at our fish in their markets and what here. What am I going to say? Sorry, our guys are going to exclude the fish. But it's almost like an yeah. apples to oranges with size of fish. That's the difficulty. Well, Dan, didn't you waive this late last year and allow some of this fish to well, come in? Well, we had to during the commercial season. Traditionally, the fish come in from you know the Mid Atlantic in the fall when some yep. of the fish was open. But our rule said that you you can't do that while our fish was open. All fishing never closed. Yep. Went right through December thirty first. Yep. So yep. we had we, we had to uh, suspend the rule. Even though after Halloween there was no fish coming into our markets, even though our fish was still open, our, our commercial boat was uncaught, fishery was open, we suspended the rule so that these fish could come into our processors. I know that some of that fish was coming in while we were still landing fish. Right. And it probably in October. It, it didn't materially affect the price that I noticed. Um, but I don't know what kind of volumes were coming in either. Maybe put a hard date on it as opposed to the end of the fishery. Maybe the end of when our fishery closes. Maybe just a hard date so it becomes easier towards the fall. Okay. Yeah, Mike. I'm totally opposed to this. I think 
100% that we should protect the fishermen of Massachusetts and not let any undersized fish from any state of jurisdiction tag or run tag into this state while our guys are fishing. Because no one's going to tell me that that's not going to affect the price that these guys are getting. And I don't care what Maryland does. They're five states away. They can take it for a whistle. We shouldn't have to listen to what they want because it's what they want is going to make money for them. It's not going to make, it's not going to put any eggs in our basket. It's just, it's going to infiltrate our fishery. It's going to drop the price of our own fishermen. And I'll use this like you just said a minute ago. You cannot import lobsters into Massachusetts that are less than the legal size. And it should be the same for striped bass. Right, but, but All right, yeah, but right. The, the reason for us to uphold that ban is because of the enforcement burden and the gross commingling. And you just take, you can't tag a lobster without killing it. Right? You can't, there's no permanent tag to kill a lobster. These fish are permanently tagged until right. right. somebody rips it off. That's fine. All right, well, we, we, I think mean, we've got some good comments. I think the second part of that is that if you want to allow all processes to import fish that are on the size, when our guys are fishing, there should be a strict restriction that they cannot market it in Massachusetts. It has to go out. They can come in the border, they can process it, do whatever they want, and wherever they sell it has to be outside the bounds of Massachusetts. That way it's not going to affect our market and our fishing. Okay. Get that, Jerry? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll move on. Um, so we're not interested in the for hire compliance so much. Are we? Yeah. More over that? Anybody want us to discuss that? Put your hand up and I'll be happy to. All right. Um, the last, how about scuff limits on drag? Going from 200 to 2,000 on the school officials. Yeah, I, I just have to ma mention a comment on that. Okay. Um, Can I give you some background? Can yeah, go ahead. Background? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, forever, um, we, in fact, we were moving more and more toward um, allowing the, the draggers to retain as much fish as they would be catching. We had weekly trip limits. We thought that was the right thing to do instead of promoting discards. Um, we have a lot of unused stuff Florida, so it doesn't make too much sense to um, force a lot of uh, regulatory discards. And um, we were reminded last year that the trip limit on a mesh smaller than uh, five inches was in fact 200 pounds. And, uh, there was a collective gasp in the state of Rhode Island and Massachusetts. So it took us about a year to convince the Mid-Atlantic Council to amend this rule that goes back to about 20 years ago when the scuff was grossly overfished. They're not overfished anymore, and they're overfishing the current. So the Mid-Atlantic Council enacted uh, a 2,000 pound trip limit for the squid fleet during those days. So we're just here to uh, complement that rule because it's already a federal rule. Let's go ahead. Yeah, so, so right now they're allowed to get 1,000 pounds, is, it? is that what it is? Right now they're allowed to get 50,000 during this time of year. But when the squid season starts, right, exactly. it was 200 pounds. And, um, but as of this year, it's gone to 2,000 pounds. And occasionally they, they I mean, most squid on, uh, squid toes have little to no scum. They might make a morning toe or a, a gong or dust toe, and then you get a big bag of fish. And so our thought is, because we have so much quota unused, what these guys retain those for. Yeah. My, my only concern about this is, and this gets back to probably about now, six, seven, eight years ago, when the alewife fishery closed down, right? One of the big arguments was about bycatching of alewives. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to open that up to a higher bycatch of alewives. We're seeing tremendous runs. I actually made, a, made a, a, a message to you guys when we posted on social media about the allies opening up. Maybe we ought to open it up again, right? But, but I think what you're going to see here is this is going to start getting a, a, a bit more bycatch well, on the allies side as well as, as squid on, on that. I mean, the money, you know? the money fish is, is squid. Yeah. And, and it's got, during the spring, it's fairly low value because the markets have usually been flooded by the traps and the weirs. Um, but aren't so, we going back to an increased bycatch on alewives if we do this? Well, I don't think that this is going to increase effort. I think it's just going to increase retention. Well, yeah, well, right. That's what I'm getting at. Is if you're saying increased retention, so you, that in means... Words, instead of kicking it to the scuppers, you put it in the toe themselves. That's what I mean by retention. Yeah. So, I mean, 
they're, they're squid grabbers, and they catch scalp as a bite. The data fear that. Well, I don't believe that regulation is going to change their fishing habits. It's just going to allow them to retain uh, the scalp on. So I, I would be in favor of it. I'm also, there is a similar regulation to that for butterfish. Is that correct? All right. Um, the last three um, technical corrections. The first one's about at sea transfers, and um, again, this is kind of technical in terms of just a hole in the regs. The fluke management plan requires us to prohibit at sea transfers, and. Um, we went into our regulations and we found that over time we kind of lost that language. So we're sort of re reestablishing that, that any trip limit managed uh, species uh, that is quota managed, uh, we're not going to allow the FC transfer, but we're not going to apply that prohibition to Menhaden uh, or other bait species, which is sold over the rail under the authority. So if you're catching the quota managed species, when I say quota managed, blue fish, Bass, sea bass, etc. Um, you can't transfer that stuff until you've got to come to, to, to show you. The by boat uh, is an interesting one. Um, it's mainly the Nantucket on the Vineyard issue because they, uh, it's a long steam back to the mainland where, where most of the fish are sold. We've allowed boats in the past to transport fish, to accept fish at the pier, not on the water, but transfer it at the pier, and one boat steams like five or ten boats daily catch back to the mainland. Um, so we're sort of establishing clear rules on that. You can see those rules in the, in the proposed uh, legal language. Um, this would extend not just to fruit, but to any other species. But this has been a pretty quiet scene over the last few years. We haven't had dry boats uh, that many uh, down on the island. So we'll, we'll keep your breath of that. And then the last one is the initial sale to a primary buyer. It's already uh, a requirement that if you're going to buy fish from commercial fishermen, you have to be a legal dealer and have primary buyer authorization. We're just flipping this and saying commercial fishermen also need to only sell fish to licensed dealers who are primary buyers. And that seems obvious, but if there's a transaction that law enforcement has detected and they want to write a violation, they really should be able to violate both parties in that transaction, not just the dealer. So any comments on any of these things? Mike. I would like to see you people revisit this at sea transfer of quota between licensed vessels who have quota. This this was a total fiasco not too many years ago with the cod fishery when you had an 800 pound quota. Guys would go out, make a set, get 2,500, 3,000, 4,000 pounds of codfish, and you're allowed to keep 800 and you got to shovel the rest. That sure doesn't do very well for the fishery when you, all these fish are going to waste and going back to the bottom. When the fish come in, it's gonna be it's gonna be go against the quota, no matter how many boats bring it in. It's better to have someone bring it in and sell it and somebody gets to eat it than it have to get shoveled over. Like I have a different bottom. I have a different perspective on that. What we were seeing was guy catches over the limit, called his son, his brother, his uncle, his, his, his workmate, and they all let out the skips, and they all pick up the extra fish, and that's that's a loser. So but he that's, shovels it overboard, what good is it? Well, yeah, we gotta find a way to reduce uh, <coughs> unnecessary discount. But, no, but and and to allow that to go on. Well, the other boat that you're talking about, the father, son, nephew, if they've got licenses and they've got quota, yeah. Mike, what's the harm? It was colossally unpopular when people saw that happen. Only because the, the scientist and the politician says, oh, if a boat catches a load of fish, everybody's no, going to target that and fish, and they're going to they're going to wipe the whole school up. Well, we have trip limits for some of these species. It's more of an issue down south, Mike. We've got uh, in sea black sea bass. I'm just saying that I fight when finish. Black sea bass really trip limits. How much? 300 pounds. You know, on rod and reel, 150. Flute, 300. So <clears throat> they're fairly small quarters. We try to spread the fishery out and maximize the price. People are pretty happy with that. The idea that one guy's going to take two, three, four, five times the trip limit, call the guys up, come get the fish, it's not going to happen. The thing is, Mike, sometimes you catch that amount of fish. I, I know, but not, not, not these fish. 
that it's not that kind of a school of species for most of these things. All right, any other comments? All right, thank you for coming. Hey, what about the charter boats boat? selling fish? The charter boats and head boats fit? Yes. So, oh, yes, okay. Um, again, this is a clarification that on a charter trip, when, when anglers are fishing oh, the authority of your charter permit, I know, didn't think you'd be here. It's prohibited from fishing commercially during the same trip. We already have that rule that says why. Why can't we commercial fish on a charter? It's allowed right now. What's changed? When you come to shore, or when your patients come to shore, and they're approached by the the first question that gets asked is, are you commercial or recreational? I know the boat. You're recreational. No, no, what's the answer? You got the girl in the First question, is this a commercial trip or recreational? Recreational. Then you can't sell it. So the people on that boat who are exempt from having a permit are just the authority of your fire permit. The fire permit is to take people out of the recreational permit. There's no restriction on the commercial permit as to how many people you can have on board and what if those people are paying. I think this is a small issue. You find that. There's a lot of there's a lot of people who are actually I see this maybe with head boats more. Do you see this issue as being a big problem as far as charter boats and stuff what, what going to the head boats? You got people commercially fishing on a head boat? I, I understand that this is a problem okay, on head boats. Yeah. But if they're coming off the head boat and they have more than the recreational limit, they're not going to be able to pull a permit out and say, Well, I'm, I'm a commercial fisherman. No, no, I'm not. I'm saying that's 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 not what I'm saying. Okay. Patrons. No, on what I'm game. talking about is the patrons on board are having their fish, and let's say they say, "Hey, I don't want all this fish. I'll give it to the to the boat." Well, that's we, that's where I think that's yeah. where I think this is stemming from. All right. Well, you're allowed and to do that in our uh, straight bass rights. Right exactly. So we're not proposing changing that. What's the proposal? So, so that's my. I guess that's my question is is, is why are we needing to change the hold for for charter boat? Okay, you this explain is really a South Coast sea bass stuff issue. We have a limited entry sea bass commercial fishery with a 150 pound daily trip limit for rod reel fishermen. We have a five fish per angler bag with limits in the recreational fishery. These fish weigh about two and a half, three pounds each. So you have a six pack charter that goes out. One guy has that limited entry rod reel commercial permit and says, no, these are you know, these are my crew from Pennsylvania out commercially <laughs> fishing for the day. I can take 150 pounds of fish, I can hand it off to them, I sold it to them. That fish is never reported against the quota. They're also at a competitive advantage against the guy who doesn't hold that limited entry commercial permit that is set at five fish a day for all his anglers. So that's really just leveling the playing field. Then I would I would say let's make this species specific hey, because this, if you're blatantly blowing it across everything, this would not impact anyone. You go out on your charter, you take ten bluefish per angler, one bass per angler, all under the recreational limit. Your anglers don't want those fish at the end of the day. Sell it, no problem with that. It's about the this is just about being able to market a commercial trip as a recreational vessel. But the wording needs to be changed. I, I well, think you say the wording needs to be the language? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the italicized okay. the bold on the back page. Well, let's look at that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.